Welcome to the Center for Global Affairs. Many of you are frequent attendees, so I'm not going to bore you. But for those of you who are here for the first time, I invite you to pick up one of these wonderful brochures, which Alice has put together, not just this, but the contents of it, because she's in charge of public events. And look through it and see what we do. We are basically home to a master's in global affairs, as well as continuing education advancement courses, many, many every semester, diploma programs, public events, grant-funded initiatives, right now primarily in northern Iraq, working on social cohesion and with refugee populations. So, and of course, public events like the one tonight. In all these endeavors, the United Nations uh, plays a very important role, both in courses, among our faculty, uh, our students get internships. Uh, we have uh, a program, an annual program, at the UN headquarters in Geneva. And uh, in addition to that, we have an annual program of workshop training for new diplomats on first assignment to the General Assembly. So there are lots of connections here with tonight. It is a great, great honor to have with us His Excellency, the Most Reverend Bernardito Siauza, who's titular bishop of Suasia. He is an apostolic, apostolic nuncio permanent observer of the Holy See to the United Nations, and permanent observer of the Holy See to the Organization of American States. I'm going to give you a short biography only, because you have a full biography in your programs. He was born in Taliban, in the Republic of the Philippines. Um, he was an ordained priest for the Diocese of Taglibalaran. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, in 85, and then in 86, he was incarnated to the newly created Diocese of Taliban. He earned a doctorate in theology and entered the diplomatic service of the Holy See in 1990. He served at the Apostolic Nunciatur in Madagascar, in Bulgaria, and then in Albania and Haiti, and of course he uh, was in Italy and in Rome, and he told me I think it was 12 years or thereabouts. Um, he served in the Secretariat of State of the Vatican, and from there he was appointed as permanent observer of the Holy See to the United Nations in New York in 2014, and permanent observer of the Holy See to the Organization of uh, American States in July of 2014. In conversation with him tonight, those of you who've been here often know, is Alon Ben Meir. Uh, many, many years of being affiliated with our Center for Global Affairs, even before there was a Center for Global Affairs. He teaches uh, courses on the Middle East. He has been an interlocutor and a conversationalist with very important guests. I think we've had every ambassador from the Middle East in this room. Um, he has been a tireless, probably the most tireless advocate that I have ever encountered for a two-state solution using every conceivable way, away, from track two to track three. Um, he's a media personality. He writes, publishes a weekly column. So, but before I pass the baton to him, uh, just a reminder that on April 6th, same time, same station here, Alon will be in conversation with the ambassador of Egypt uh, to the UN. Please join me in welcoming our honored guests and Alon. Thank you so much, Vera for your wonderful, as always, introduction. But you didn't mention, you didn't mention track four. You mentioned <laughs> two, one, two, and three. <laughs> uh, uh, Ambassador, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm thank really you. honored and grateful for being here. 
Uh, before I ask our, you know, start with our conversation, I would like you to perhaps uh, take a few minutes to tell our audience here, what is the mission of the Vatican to the United Nations? What are some of the responsibilities or the objectives that the Vatican would like to achieve in the context of the United Nations? Yes, thank you for that. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Holy See, the Vatican, as it is commonly said, uh, became a, you know, established a permanent mission to the United Nations here in New York uh, in 1964. But even before that, the Holy See, the Pope, had always been invited to, uh, especially to give an intervention at the general debate at the United Nations. But only in 1964, that a permanent mission was established to the United Nations. And since then, our presence has been stable, has been stable, you might say. We have always been there. And as a permanent observer, uh, that means that uh, a permanent observer is the permanent representative of the Pope of the Holy See to the United Nations. We are called permanent observer, or I am called permanent observer, uh, to distinguish myself from a permanent representative. That means that a permanent representative is the ambassador of a full member country to the United Nations, while a permanent observer is the ambassador, the representative of a permanent observer state. That complicates even more the matter. But anyway, our primary mission really is our objective is to share our own experience, our points of view to all the international debates at the United Nations. Because if you look at the United Nations Charter, the pillars of the United Nations objectives, the vision of the United Nations, are we, those universal values that we all share. And if you look at the social doctrine, the social teaching of the Catholic Church, then you will find these same pillars are there. Above all, we all work fundamentally for peace and security of all, and then we work for the respect of the fundamental human rights, and then we all would like to promote the observance of international treaties and international law, and then we all work to foster integral human development. These are the primary objectives of the United Nations that we share as, uh, as, uh, you know, as Catholic Church, as the Vatican. So uh, for us, these are also our primary objectives in the long run. You know, we would like to share our own experience of humanity, as we call that. We have the bimillennial experience of humanity being a very old institution, a very ancient institution. And with this objective, then we participate in all the debates in the United Nations. So that's how we uh, function, that's how we uh, get into uh, the activities of the United Nations. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. You know, in, in the same context, you know, you have described the role or the, that uh, the Vatican is playing, or would like to play, and provide an example of, um, of the various, um, the position that you are taking in, in connection with uh, refugees, in connection with the human rights, in connection with various conflicts. Um, I must tell you, you know, um, my, I, me personally, I have the greatest respect for Pope Francis, and I don't say this lightly, uh, because here one, and I, I don't want to say even he's one of the most progressive, it's probably the most progressive Pope that we have had in so many years. Uh, this, this is a, a man who has devoted himself to what's right, and he's been advocating all of these, you know, the, the various crises that are taking place in the Middle East, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the horrifying civil war in Syria, and there's no question he's been providing this spiritual guidance, which is missing. There's no question it is missing in today's among the, the head of state and the politicians. My, my, I would like to know what sort of a practical role can, in fact, the Vatican play in order to advance the various positions, the various, let's call it preaching, that's taken a place. Because what I think, since the Pope Francis in particular enjoy this type of reput reputation, my feeling is he can play a more practical role in advancing some of the things that he is saying in connection with resolving conflict, resolving uh, you know, in the Middle East and elsewhere. What it is that you feel can be done, that the church can assume further responsibility in that regard. 
Yeah, this certainly is a very huge question for us also. Uh, I would say that uh, indeed uh, the international community has really taken notice of practically whenever the Pope opens his mouth, there is always a reaction. And there are always, you know, uh, journalists and analysts who would, you know, take uh, and, you know, analyze his words and what he intends to do. It's true that uh, all these priorities, for instance, the dialogue uh, the, and conflict resolution, we really take that very seriously. And, uh, you know, the, the Holy See has one of the most extensive uh, diplomatic uh, networks uh, in the world. We are, you know, we have uh, diplomatic relations with 183 countries. And then we are in all the multilateral uh, international and regional organizations. Uh, of course, our, our, our diplomatic staff is not big, but everyone is being instructed to, write, to make a follow-up on what the Pope you know, wants us to do. And that's what I try to do here at the United Nations level. I'll, you know, I, I think we can see it more clearly when we give uh, uh, probably specific examples of uh, you know, the really some of the issues that really uh, are very close to the heart of the Pope that he really wants to do something concrete. And I think his uh, trips is one of those indications of the most burning questions in the world that he would really try to make a difference. Uh, for instance, his visit to Central Africa, uh, Republic, his visit to Bangui was, 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 was really intentional in the sense that he thought that the Holy Father could make a difference in the local situation there, the war, to stop the war. And I, I say that thanks be to God, uh, you know, he, he achieved something there. And then, uh, of course, uh, no achievement is permanent, and so we were, it is always a daily work. It is always a daily work to consolidate whatever has been reached. And he went to uh, the Holy Land. He went to Israel right. and Palestine and Jordan, because, as you said, that's certainly it's one of the most uh, important questions for, for us also. I mean, you know, uh, that's the cradle of Christianity. That's where we were born. And so it, it, is, it is not only a political question for us, it's a question of essence, practically. Right. And uh, so, of course, it's a, such a highly political question, very highly charged with lots of elements that are there. And then his visit to the Philippines was uh, primarily, as you said, an expression of solidarity to make people feel that after such a disaster of uh, you know, the huge uh, typhoon in 2013, in fact, uh, uh, less than two months after the typhoon, uh, you know, I was receiving a private audience, and he told me, I'll tell you three secrets I haven't told anybody yet. And one of those was, I'm going to the Philippines. He said, tell me when. I said, well, January is the, first, is, is the best time to visit. But uh, he said, oh, January. And it was December 19, I remember the date. And he said, oh, January is too near. That would be for next year. So January, the following year, he went to the Philippines and said, primarily, I want to be there immediately after this tragedy. I want the people to feel that you know, I, I do care for this concretely, not only that I see something, but I have to be physically present. And that's what he tried to achieve, and I think you know, the people really remember that very much. And then, you know, of course, the visit in the United Nations, the visit in the United States, all these uh, two times in Cuba, so uh, the, the, these are, we might say, almost like targeted visits in which the Pope would like to uh, express something that is important to him and important also to the world. Now, today especially, so many things in the news that the Pope is planning to go to South Sudan. Certainly the situation yeah. there is very difficult, but that's another example of how much he would like to make it something concrete. Uh, I mean, not only saying that, you know, we are in solidarity with South Sudan, but I must say would like to go there. Yeah, but when you talk about something concrete, I mean, can you cite an example? He went to Palestine, he went to Israel, he went to, and he met with the political leaders there. Uh, did he try, for example, to talk, he's not a politician, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, the conflict between the two sides is intense. Uh, he has tremendous interest and concern over it. He would like to see a resolution to the conflict. Just, just. As an example, what, did he have an opportunity to, in fact, sit down and talk about the differences between the two sides? Has he been mm -hmm. able, since then, to pursue that visit and try to advance, for example, this particular conflict? Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, uh, we might say it's almost like an asymmetric conflict, as we know, that uh, with the 1947 UN resolution creating two states, which ended uh, the British mandate, you know, 
half of that, only half of the tradition is being fulfilled. You know, there is the state of Israel, 1948, and until now the state of Palestine has not been realized. So it is, uh, you know, when the Holy Father went there, of course, he had these private uh, conversations with uh, Netanyahu and Abbas. We don't know exactly. There are no records, whatever, these private conversations, they are off the record. But anyway, uh, the, 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 the Holy See thinks that First of all, it must, they must, it must be direct negotiations with uh, the assistance, with the help of the international community. That is the position of the Holy See. However, you know, it is an asymmetric thing. So I said, uh, Palestine, and you know, we have to give uh, more and more Palestine a kind of a, of, of a status. That's why we supported uh, the uh, UN resolution and Palestine becoming a permanent observer state at the United Nations, of course. That as, that's the United Nations Assembly decision, not the Security Council. And then uh, in, uh, in uh, two years ago, uh, the Holy See made a, 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 the, what's this, an accord with, with, the, with the state of Palestine. At that time, it was Palestinian Authority. And then last uh, January last year, a new accord uh, came into effect, came into force now with the, with the, the Holy See and the state of Palestine. Of course, uh, Israel, you know, protested about that. Right. Yeah, but uh, for for us, that's a that's a, that's a, a sign that we want this two-state solution, which is our position to advance, and probably, uh, you know, making a concrete step, uh, you know, to to realize that the that the solution. But when he did that, however, uh, to some extent, he alienated the Israelis, that is, from their perspective. Uh, there is no way to do it, but you would, <laughs> <laughs> well, you would well, have I, to be open to, to both sides, but you know, when you no, make a step. There's no doubt. Yeah. Let, let's yeah. say that three years ago, the, uh, were the, the late Paris and Abbas were invited to the Vatican. Yeah. Uh, why, for example, uh, should not Pope Francis now invite Netanyahu and Abbas and sit down with them and say, look, yeah, this is your problem, this is a conflict, we have vested interest in resolving this conflict. I mean, do you see this kind of active involvement in order to use this, the office of the Pope, which is very significant and powerful, in order to, in a practical sense, move the, this type of conflict? And I don't want to talk just about yeah. Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We would like to talk about other conflicts where he would, without mm -hmm. any question, have certain influence that he can exert. Yeah, that's also depends on how much uh, the church uh, locally also has influence. There are certainly different degrees of how much you could influence the government by your mere presence in the ground, on how much you are, you know, how much you are a force in society. And, uh, uh, you know, it is probably not well known that every six months there is a bilateral high-level uh, uh, meeting uh, with, with the state of Israel. And uh, there are so many issues there. It's not only the question of the two-state solution, but of course, it's uh, it's also a place where you know Israel could make complaints <laughs> about uh, we might say uh, measures uh, that the Holy See, the Pope, uh, has taken with regards to Palestine. And then at the same time, you know, there are questions there directly uh, between Israel and the Holy See. Uh, unless as, I mean, what, yeah. what are they discussing There's questions, yet? for instance, in that, uh, you know, there is uh, uh, an accord. Uh, we might see a framework agreement between the Holy See and the State of Israel, which is 1992 or 1991, so it's old. But there are so many, there are provisions there which have not been uh, concretely implemented because there has been no agreement in the concrete. I'll give you an example. Yes. Uh, taxes. Uh, the, the free movement of... Uh, of, of the of the Christians uh, Catholics in uh, in 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 the Holy Land, uh, the question of uh, Catholic priests, uh, uh, foreign Catholic priests, be given a visa uh, by Israel, or a question of Palis is very delicate. Uh, Palestinian priests in the uh, to be, uh, to be able to do uh, priestly uh, duties inside the occupied territories or even inside the state of Israel. So these are concrete uh, uh, questions which are still being treated. For instance, the question of schools. You know, there are everywhere we are. We already have bilateral agreements with the state. You know, there are more than 120,000 schools, uh, Catholic schools in the world, and even in Israel there are. And you know, there are still questions about you know having the state uh, uh, 
subsidizing, uh, we might say, education up to a certain extent, and yet uh, Christian schools or Catholic schools also in that part uh, does not benefit from it. So there, there, is, uh, there is the question of, uh, I mean, all these very practical questions are all uh, still to be de but my, my decided. My understanding yeah. is that the Israeli government is in fact uh, been, has been helpful and has not really put, uh, delivered any obstacle, for example, in the way a priest, a Catholic priest, may be traveling from the West Bank to Israel proper and vice versa. I mean, as far as I know, there were no particular restrictions imposed on them. Uh, do you there, uh, it, depends, uh, it depends on the time. Uh, you know, there have been, uh, there, there, were, there were months, there have been years in which, especially when a Palestinian priest couldn't get the permission to go to, let's say, Jerusalem. So, I mean, you know, there, there, are, there are times in which uh, we, we might change with uh, the, the, the faucet is closed, or the faucet is open little, a little bit. There are also times, uh, yeah, we understand that there are security concerns, especially when there are like bombings or, you know, attempts. So, so how uh, do you characterize violence, the relationship uh, nowadays between Israel and the Vatican? Well, we always say it's cordial. And there are, you know, the, the thing is uh, this uh, agreement has been uh, this accord uh, should have been, uh, uh, we might say, implemented, you know, a long time ago. But uh, we know that there are always problems. We understand that. And then many of these, like uh, the question of uh, properties, for instance, titles. And uh, so the, 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 uh, these questions are not solved. I mean, you, th you think that these questions would be so normal in other countries. But you know, in, in, of course, in the Holy Land where there is not so much land, <laughs> it becomes very, very touchy, even for us, for the Catholic Church. You know, that's, that's why I understand why these problems, which should have been very normal in other countries, have become complicated even there. Well, my, yeah. my understanding, you know, when, when the Vatican recognized the Palestinian, or Palestine as a state, uh, there was not much effort made by the, by the Holy See to take some count to other measures. Mm -hmm. in order to compensate, not in terms of compensating Israel, but to have a dialogue, open dialogue, to continue the dialogue with, with Israel. My understanding is that that dialogue did not really take place. No, I mean, you know, there is always, uh, uh, there is always this uh, every six months uh, <coughs> bilateral dialogue. In so connection I think it's, with yeah. this issue in particular. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, not that they didn't know about it. I mean, they have been warned for, for certainly long before that. And besides, uh, what do you understand by the state of Israel? It's the uh, understanding that the United Nations has in the state of, state of Israel. The state of Israel, at the United Nations context, it really doesn't have sovereignty. It's not uh, for a state to have uh, to, to, to have the, all the characteristics of a state. It must be. It is a only the Security Council could make that determination. So uh, you know, state of Is the state of Palestine in the UN context is really more about, you know, a, a kind of a political declaration rather than a real, you know, sovereign state. So that's also how we, under, that's also, as the Holy See made it, made it very, very clear, even in the accord, that the understanding of the use, that the use of the term state of Palestine is taken from the United Nations resolution. So that's where you get your context. And that's why even when they made this accord, it was made very clear that this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, the Holy See wants this to be an encouragement uh, for further talks in the, in the two-state solution. I mean, you could always uh, you could always question intentions, but because no, there no, are I'm intentions, not, not, but the intention was it is very clear in the accord that this is meant to continue or to encourage a dialogue on the two-state solution. My question, though, mm -hmm. after the recognition, was there any effort made to sit down with the Israelis and begin a sort of um, in, in some kind of mediation between the two sides, now you have recognized Palestine as a Palestinian state. Oh, well, I'm sure. I'm sure but, they were. But um, yeah. are you, I am not aware. I mean, are you I, I'm certain not. that actually there was a dialogue with Israel trying to mediate now that we have recognized Palestine as a Palestinian state? To how to what other steps? You know that uh, you know that uh, the, you know that uh, the state of Israel and the Holy See they have official diplomatic relations. So that's where the channels that they use. I mean, you know, there are so many things that we don't actually know, but which were happening. I mean, who would have known among here that this that there is every six months there is a formal two-day meetings between the state of Israel and the Holy See? You know, even the many Catholics wouldn't know that. 
So tell yes, me, how was, how uh, was yeah. your relationship with the Israeli ambassador to the UN? Oh, they were very, very, <laughs> very friendly, <laughs> of course. I mean, they, we know each other's positions. They know the, the position of the Holy See and the question of Palestine. And every time there is a, uh, an open debate in the Middle East, it's always like an open debate at the Security Council. It always says the question of the Middle East, including the Palestinian question. It's not practically a separate open debate, although in most of the times it's focused on the Palestinian question. So every time that there is an open debate, uh, we always have, we, we always deliver a statement. Uh, of course, uh, Israel and, the, and, the, and Palestine, they are the two special guests when there is this open debate and they are given, uh, you know, uh, the privilege of place in the debate. And then afterwards, you know, all the other states and observer states, etc. So uh, every time that uh, we, I mean, our position has been made clear and always repeated every time that we speak at these occasions. So Israel knows very well our position on the question. Yeah, you know, I just want to mention to you something about a number of weeks ago when President Trump was talking about uh, relocating the American embassy to, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, we, we come up with certain ideas in terms of how can we convert that potential crisis into something, uh, a breakthrough, in order, in fact, to advance the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm -hmm. To that end, I've been in touch with Cardinal McCarrick in, in D.C., and he passed on a message that we prepared to the Holy See that, uh, this is just a case in point that I want to mention to you, where I felt that intervention then that is, if, there were, if the Pope were to intervene and suggest to the Trump administration, if you want to make the move, make the move, provided that you can make it, make it so that would be the, out, uh, the outcome would be extremely positive, but also recognize is Jerusalem to be the capital of the state of Palestine. I'm not sure what the Holy See has done so far with the proposal I've submitted. Mm. Did you hear anything about it? Is there any no. discussion about what the Holy See is planning to do uh, has they taken a position in concerning concerning the relocation of the American embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? And what's your particular, what the, what the Holy See position in this regard? Do you support this kind of move? Absolutely not. I mean, it's very, it's contrary to our, it's contrary to, uh, the, above all, we are, uh, the Holy See uh, follows, uh, you might say, the universal position of most of the states in the world, not to recognize uh, uh, you know, the whole of Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, that's why the embassies are in Tel Aviv. And we have our embassy to Israel in, uh, in Jaffa, of south of Tel Aviv. And then we also, of course, we have a mission in what we call the Holy Land, which is the Mount of Olives. Now, certainly the position of the Holy See is not, uh, I mean, uh, you know, moving the capital to Jerusalem without, as you said, without comfort, the counterpart, we certainly, uh, it's certainly against the position of the Holy See. But, but when you say, uh, when I ask you, you know, whether you, you support this move, you said categorically, you no, know, you shouldn't. Yeah. What, I'm, what I'm saying is, <coughs> is there any effort made or could have made by the Holy See to take advantage of what, what President Trump wanted to do, now the whole issue is basically is put on the back burner. Yeah. So it is no longer a hot issue that needs to be dealt with today. Yeah. But I'm saying... He has I'm not saying, even repeated it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> is, is, there, you know, is there any still an opportunity? Because when you have something like this, I always look for breakthrough when there is a breakdown in, in, in any situation. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is that the, in this particular case, the Holy See might have missed an opportunity to advance Israeli-Palestinian We conflict. do not know what the Pope has done in, in other, you know, there are, you know, there are official channels certainly that he could do it, but I, I couldn't tell you, if I, I, I have not been informed of any such steps have been taken, so I couldn't say yes or no, well, that he took something. Yeah. Hopefully he will be informed <laughs> soon. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's yeah. move on to, you know, I know how the um, Holy Father is so concerned, and for good reason, of course, about the problems of the refugees. Uh, what we are seeing now in the, as a result of the civil war in Syria, uh, it's, a, it's a tragedy that has been unfolding in front of our eyes for the last six years, uh, unlike anything that happened since World War II. Uh, again, uh, I'm always interested to find out, you know, given the, the influence and the power of the, of the Pope, other than, which is important, mind you, I'm absolutely not minimizing the importance of his compassion and his call 
Western communities, other countries, to absorb more refugees and provide them with the kind of help they need. And he's also appealing to the refugees to respect the laws of their host countries. So, that's, so he's sending the, the, the proper message to both, to the host countries as well as to the refugees. What else, is there anything beyond that that, that the Holy can do in order to alleviate some of this major crisis connection with the refugees? Certainly on the ground we have, uh, we have done much more than uh, not only as Pope, not only as Holy See, but above all as Catholic Church. We certainly is one of the great providers of, of help for the refugees and, uh, and migrants in general. And uh, even in the United States, one of the biggest agencies to settle uh, refugees here and who support uh, what we call sponsor refugees is, is the Catholic Church. And uh, it's true, I mean, first of all, that we always say words are not enough. So I think uh, uh, the first uh, trip of the Pope outside Rome was really for the refugees, for migrants who were drowning in, uh, in the Mediterranean. You know, he went to, he went to, the, to, to after the tragedy of more than three, Around 300 people died in that in that shipwreck there, and then, and then he went to visit uh, uh, Greece. I mean, you know that island, uh, Lesbos, uh, was facing was facing Turkey, and of course we always see words are not important. So he put some concrete things into that word by bringing back with him uh, seven families to back to the Vatican, and you know took the same plane that he took. So we might say, you know, these are drops in the ocean, but these are really good examples uh, also for all of the institutions and the Catholics to do more. You know that Italy, in spite of, uh, in spite of the fact that it's not certainly the, the biggest or the richest country in Europe, Italy by far has accepted the most number of asylum seekers. The, uh, Italy accepted last year almost 200,000 asylum seekers. I mean, giving them Italian residency. Why is it possible for Italy? Because the Catholic Church sponsors them. Parishes, uh, convents, uh, schools, uh, dioceses. So that makes, uh, if, if, uh, if the Catholic churches also in other parts of Europe would, would do the same concrete steps, then that would also multiply, we might say, that really concrete effect that we are looking for in order to help these asylum seekers and refugees. Problem is uh, the number has become so big. And we know now that the biggest driver, the biggest push factor of uh, the incredible rise of people on the move, and above all, refugees, is war, or, you know, it's, it's war and conflict. You know, of course, yes. in 2015 alone, 200, more than 255 million people crossed borders. And of these number, 65.3 million were refugees, which means technically these are people driven out of their homes and countries by wars, persecutions, discriminations, and everything, you know, violence. And then you add it to that, the other forced migrants, you know, not all forced migrants are refugees, not all refugees are forced migrants. You add to that tens of millions of forced migrants who were driven out of their home, not necessarily by violence, not necessarily by violations of fundamental human rights, but also by extreme poverty, by what they called also now the UN and some states are introducing a new category of people in the move. They call them climate change asylum seekers or <laughs> something like that, it's climate change forced migrants. So uh, the, the problem is huge. Uh, and the problem is, uh, it is good, it is very good that we have to encourage that every country should be able to accommodate, at least in Europe, where there was the suggestion of having each country accept the number of refugees according to the proportion of the population. We know that many countries refused. The, 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 the tragedy, is a, this tragedy already of refugees and forced migrants, is that it coincides with a crisis in Europe. You know, it's not the... I believe that it's not the refugee crisis, it's not the migration crisis that causes the crisis in Europe, but rather it's the other way around. Europe was already in crisis when this refugee crisis came to Europe. And that is, Europe already had so many doubts about its identity. People were already revolting against what they called, we are being ruled by high paid uh, bureaucrats in Brussels. <laughs> I mean, if you go to Europe, these are the things you, you hear. 
And then that's why it's certainly the rise of populism, the rise of nationalism is, is, is from that. And at the same time, this, this feeling of not being able anymore to have a voice in your own destiny, on your political programs, etc., was coincided with uh, an economic crisis. So all these factors were there when the refugee crisis arrived in Europe. That made Europe really look more closed than I think Europe should have been. Uh, I mean, there, is a, 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 there, a, there have been a concurrences, a concurrence of factors that, uh, that, uh, that has made uh, the refugee crisis even more tragic. And uh, I think uh, that's why I think it, it will, it needs time to settle down. Europe would have to settle down on what it really it is and what could it, it must do or should do uh, in order to, 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 in order to, to, to face this challenge. And I'm sure it's going to continue unless the wars, uh, with, you know, wars in, uh, in 2006 when Ban Ki-moon became Secretary General of the United Nations, there were only 13 active wars in the world. Last year, there were 39 and 15 latent conflicts. I mean, tensions, situations of tensions with the capacity to explode one day to become a full-scale war. So we are in that world of, uh, we are in that world of wars, and at the same time, there is certainly so much economic inequalities between different parts of the world, and that's why a huge number of people in the move are also what we call economic migrants. Yeah, let me, let me switch then, I, and um, you know, we are looking at this conflict you mentioned, several of them, of course, in the Middle East and elsewhere. But some, there's one common denominator, and that is religion. What we are witnessing now is that groups, extremists, like ISIS, like others, the Sunni Shiite conflict, there's the, the, the religion itself is being used, or I should say abused. Yeah. Uh, and the killing and the raping and the destruction is taking place in the name of God, so to speak. And that is actually what we are witnessing. So how do you explain this phenomenon? That, you know, whether Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, all these three monolithic religions preach peace, amity, uh, equality, compassion, and understanding. But then elements within the three are actually using religion to abuse and use uh, you know, other people. Why do you feel religion has become a tool for this abuse rather than a tool to promote peace and amity between people and nations? Your question, I mean, that uh, uh, your question uh, reminds me of two, I think, very, very important uh, books which came out in the 1990s. Uh, first, uh, the first was about uh, this collection of uh, essays and experiences of people in peacemaking and peace building. The title was Religion, the Missing Dimension of Statecraft, which argues that religion plays, as you said, a dominant role sometimes in international affairs, conflicts, etc. And yet, in finding solutions to these problems, religion has been completely undervalued or forgotten or neglected. And then the second book, of course, the most, probably the most, uh, the more famous, of course, uh, that of Huntington, you know, uh, the, the clash of civilizations. Mm -hmm. You know, that reminds me, you know, it's, it's incredible. I mean, when Huntington, uh, before he published it, of course, it was his paper to the foreign relations, uh, the foreign affairs, I would say, the Council for Foreign Relations. Uh, it was his lecture, and of course he developed it into a book. When it was published, even before it was published, so he, he published his conference in the, in the, in the Foreign Affairs uh, 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 Review, and then when it was published in the book, there was so much you know, uh, dissent against, uh, against his theory, against his position, that the next, uh, the next wars will not be based uh, nor on economics nor on politics, but it will be along the lines of civilizations. And he said, and the biggest element and the deepest element of civilization is religion. And that's why he kind of proposed that in the future, there will be many conflicts which will be either provoked or caused by religions. I think th this, this question is, 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 I mean, you know, I cited as two books because in a sense we could conclude both negatively and positively about religion. It's very, it's very interesting that religion 
has become such a huge topic of debate at the United Nations, especially after <coughs> first, uh, before the terrorist, uh, before ISIS, Al Qaeda was already there, so it was already, you know. But you know, it still did not uh, push the United Nations to, to 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 treat the question of religion and its role in the stopping radical education, radical fun fundamentalisms, etc. The first is, is the role of religion was very positive in terms of the Millennium Development Goals. That was a very positive evaluation. And then came all these uh, uh, terrorist groups claiming to, claiming to kill, claiming to, do, to commit violence in the name of religion or even in behalf of God. So uh, you see that really gives us such a bad name to religion. But I think that's uh, the problem I think that the international community has come to realize that this kind of abuse of religion could not be fought more effectively, neither by military might nor by political but that's, programs. But that's a question. But, yeah. Yeah, but that's a question. Yeah. A, how do you fight it? That's uh, really, I mean, what, what role is the, 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 the church can play in this regard? You know that the whole week, uh, this week, you know, the first, uh, I mean, last, uh, last week, uh, you know, the, there is a first, uh, it's really a first, it's historical, uh, a joint, uh, a seminar at the Lazar University jointly uh, organized by the Holy See and a Lazar University on how to combat violent extremism, how to, uh, we might say, how to prevent children from becoming uh, radicals, from being recruited as so I, I think I think that's important because let, let, let's because that is point. based on our basic principle that the best way to fight this uh, this spurious use of religion or this spurious religion is authentic religion. So if you I think we believe that the most effective way to fight this abuse of religion is by using religion itself, especially by presenting what religion truly is. I mean, what is authentic. Uh, what is no, genuine this is religion. exactly the point yeah. that I was going to make in terms yeah. of that is uh, you have to create a religious counter narrative yeah. in order to dissuade the would be radicals from uh, joining the, the rank of the radicals and commit the kind of atrocities. Um, and I think this is uh, absolutely right in that sense that the counter narrative usually now, now is not uh, what I, when you go to Europe and elsewhere, they're not using religion, religious concept and precept to create that counter-narrative in order to, for the young, they, they hear what ISIS is saying, they hear what other Al-Qaeda is saying, and we were trying to do, basically try to introduce different kind of programs, uh, different ideas, uh, you know, in order to rehabilitate, but there's that missing, and, and I noticed this throughout Europe, what is missing is act, actually creating the religious counter-narrative in order to counter what ISIS and others are preaching. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad to hear that you are actually saying that. So what, what's wrong in this regard, again, the, the Holy See is playing, to create that kind of counter-narrative? That is actually our, uh, we, we uh, as, as the Holy Father would say, dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. He said that those are the three most important things. And uh, it is uh, through our contacts with the, of course, uh, above all, the official and also the personal level, our contacts with these religions which have been, I think, presently, in our present times, most affected by this. And I think uh, there is, I mean, it's pretty sure that it's Islam that is, uh, at this point in time, is really affected by this, uh, by this, uh, by this, uh, by this problem because it is uh, Islam that is being used by these terrorist groups as an excuse for committing violence so why, why and discrimination. So we, we uh, 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 said uh, the hour, uh, this uh, seminar in Al Azhar is, is just uh, one of those prime examples of what we concretely do in order to help uh, the, uh, the Islamic world, uh, you know, support them in their efforts. Because if there is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, I think it must be, it is the Islamic world. It is Islam that must take lead. Because, I mean, if they have to be credible to, 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 uh, to, to Islamic people, you have to be to go to those who believe in Islam, then this counter narrative must come from them. Our, I guess, the, 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 the duty or the responsibility of other religions, Catholics and, and, and others, must be to support this, uh, this move. Uh, you know, it is, it is the paradox, you know, that in countries where there is so much 
violence uh, using religion, it is also in those countries where authentic version of that religion has difficulty, that they have so much fear that they would be the ones killed also. So it, it, it is in, in that respect that uh, when, 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 uh, when, when an Islamic uh, authentic religious leaders, you might say like al Hazar, what's doing now, is supported, is being seconded by other religions, then I think they have more courage and uh, the, 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 they are, we might say, they feel more probably secure, you know, in, in, their, in, their, you know, in, their, in their fight, in their courage to take positions against uh, these spurious versions of their own religion. So uh, we could not, I don't think that, uh, I mean, the Holy Father, especially in his visit to Albania, for instance, that was the biggest occasion in which he made his uh, statements so clear about, you know, this blasphemy, See that certainly the biggest blasphemy against religion is to claim religion is to do violence, to commit violence in the name of that religion. I mean, there would be no greater blasphemy to, than that. So, while well, the Holy See is taking all these very clear positions against the fundamentalisms and against the use of violence in furthering not only religious but political aims, then I think that is, uh, I mean, you know, we, we made it clear. I mean, we make that position clear. And I think uh, that, is, that is a contribution. But what, what, from your perspective, though, I mean, much of the violence has taken place, and I'm not in, many, in any ways demean Islam, because I, I absolutely believe Islam, like Christianity and Judaism, basically you know, promote the same values. But much of many of these conflicts today in the region, in the Middle East in particular, the Muslim, you know, when you talk about authentic Islam, for ISIS, what they are practicing is also authentic. Well, there, yeah. authentic That's Islam. exactly the point. Now, so yeah. the Quran, like the Judaism, like Christianity, are given you know, any kind of interpretation. Now, where do you begin a process where you can create some kind of harmony? Is it at all possible? I mean, religion within all of these religions, be that between the three, the three monolithic religions, you have various... Uh, uh, branches. Yeah. In, in Islam, you have half a dozen branches, in particular Sunni Shah. Mm -hmm. you know, in, in Christianity, you have 15, 20 different kind of branches. Mm -hmm. In Judaism, at least three or four that I know of. <laughs> so they, they are not going to be able to bridge these uh, differences, mm -hmm. however they interpret their religion as mm -hmm. they see it. Nowadays, that these are differences are now taken among the Muslim world, unfortunately, a more violent turn, very violent turn. How do you, how do you explain that? How does I'll explain? tell you a, a joke. Uh, when I was a student in Rome. Uh, one of my classmates, you know, you know, it was a time that there was really the Al Qaeda. You know, there was so much uh, violence, and then, and then somebody said, you know, he said, you know, you see, Islam is violent. And then uh, one of my classmates said, well. He said, we were like that during the Middle Ages. <laughs> what he was trying to say that probably other religions have, have gone beyond that stage in which we have to use violence in order to impose on others our own interpretation of our own religion. And uh, of course, there is also the question of whether or not a certain religion has a certain structure of authority and uh, whether or not, you know, uh, how the... the how uh, the, 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 the instruments, the methods they use to interpret uh, uh, their sacred texts. I mean, you know, the Christianity certainly has undergone that through modernism, etc. The use of the historical method in order to analyze, uh, uh, you know, biblical texts, etc. So uh, I think uh, from that, <coughs> that, that's, that might be, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert in Islam, but, uh, you know, as an outsider, I mean, somebody who is, uh, you know, an amateur reader of things like, you know, this, of these questions. I believe that this is one of the, uh, of the challenges of Islam now. I mean, who has the authority to interpret uh, the sacred text? And, and that authority is, should be accepted by the believers. Uh, the problem is if everyone has uh, feels or every group feels to have that authority to interpret the sacred text according you know, according to their own ends, according even to their own purposes, then that's a problem of that religion. Well, this is nothing in you. I mean, over the centuries, uh, and that's why all, we're like in the Middle religions, Ages. You know, <laughs> they have a, then, you know, their own interpretation. Yeah. As Judaism, Christianity is just the same. 
and that is not going to change. And of course, you know, you're talking about religious war going back mm. centuries, specifically in Europe, uh, and that has, of course, you know, the, the church eventually gave into the political system, and there's a clear mm. separation. And one of the problems um, in, a, in, the, in the Middle East in particular, there's not as yet a clear separation between the so-called state mm -hmm. and mosque, or state and religion. I mean, this is one of the problem. But then yeah. the other problem is that I think there's a historical perspective. Mm -hmm. That is the Middle East, you know, why now? Why in the Middle East? In the wake of World War II, the establishment of all of mm -hmm. these Arab countries, yeah. the arbitrary division between yeah, the yeah. various countries, irrespective of ethnicity, yeah. sex, and etc. Yeah, all of yeah. this, uh, all of this has created the you know the, the basis, the, the, the roots, the base of the environment yeah. that what you know translated to what we are witnessing today. Where this is going to lead to, and and, and, I, and I agree with you. The Arab state themselves, is, the Muslim state in particular, Muslim Arabs, need to themselves, because if they don't take care of that issue and they don't begin to deal with it effectively, uh, the Christians or the Jews are not going to be able to solve that kind of problem. But now you have the much longer, the much more enduring conflict between in Islam itself, and that is between the Sunni and the Shia. And that is not something that, in my view anyway, is not going to be resolved anytime soon. Uh, because in, in, in attached to that conflict between the Sunni and Shia, there's a, a political position, namely competition, question of hegemony, Regional Saudi rivalries, Arabia yeah. versus Iran. So where do we go with that? That is, that conflict between the Sunni and the Shia is going to continue for a while. And it feeds into, into other conflicts as we are seeing now in Syria, we're seeing still in Iraq, going actually through civil war, Iraq itself, Sunni killing Shia, Sunni, Shia, Shia killing Sunni. Where do we go with that? I mean, if you were to advise, if the, if the Holy Father is going to advise any Arab country, you need to do A, B, C, and D, what would that be? What kind of advice would you give them? I would take a word from what you said. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, what's this? Uh, when you say that there is, uh, there, there is the conflation of religion, politics, and even regional rivalries between these two. I mean, course, yeah. you know, we have to name names. Right. You have Saudi Arabia and you have Iran. And then, uh, you know, on the sides, you have Qatar, you have Bahrain, which has become a problem with, uh, with, with, with Iran, etc. The, 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 it's, it's, it's really there. I mean, you know, that's the, it's, it's the parallel problem I have with what they call the Arab Spring. I mean, where could we start to separate religion from politics? Uh, it, it, it gives me, uh, I mean, you know, probably the nearest uh, historical parallel I could, I, could, I could probably learn something is Northern Ireland. I mean, I was trying to, as a joke, I told an Irish, he said, you know, why is it that the Catholics are, uh, you know, is, is, it that, is, is, is it true that this is uh, what they call a sectarian conflict. Could you ask the, 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 the Saudis and the Persian, or the Persians, the Iranians, yeah. is this a sectarian conflict or this is political? Because what the Irish told me, he was mad when I kind of provoked him to say that this is a sectarian conflict, although I know very well the positions of the Irish about that. And so he said, no, this is political. What I said, but the problem is, I said, almost 99% of the unionists are Protestants, and 95% of the nationalists are Catholics. And how could you explain that to ordinary people that, they're, that they're, this is not, since it is clearly that the Catholics are nationalists and the Protestants are unionists? It's like just saying, you know, uh, the, the Iranians, uh, you know, all of the, almost all of them are Shiites, while the, while the Saudis are almost all of them Sunnis. You, could, you, could we tell them that there is nothing religious in this rivalry? Well, of course there is, and the point is, is that not only that, uh, you know, religion is being, and what we are witnessing actually the, the, the precise opposite direction, that is, look at Turkey today. Turkey is moving more and more toward becoming more and more Islamist yeah. rather than more, more democratic. Yes. Uh, Iran, only before 1979, was a more, a more secular state. Today is a very yeah. religious state. And so we are, what we are looking at a different trend, as a matter yeah, the opposite trend. And yeah. when you have that opposite strain, actually it's further magnifying the differences between the various religious sects. That's what we are seeing, and where this is going to lead. Would that continue, uh -huh. from your perspective, mm -hmm. would that continue to evolve in that direction? 
where religion become now the, <coughs> the, the center of conflict between these various countries. That's what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, I would love to be uh, optimist that it would take the opposite direction. <laughs> because, I mean... But, but no, uh, I'm talking about in terms of, from your perspective, as from the perspective of the church, the Catholic mm -hmm. church, uh, do you see, you know, from your own experiences, do you see where this could lead to what role, can, if any, the, the church can it play in this? Well, regard? really, I mean, in this, uh, uh, our, our, uh, the role that we could play is really secondary in the sense that, you know, in Iran or in Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia we could, you could not even bring an, a Bible or a cross, even how much you hide it in your, in your Do luggage. Do you have any relationship yeah. with Iran or no, Saudi we, Arabia? No, uh, uh, with Iran, we have, uh, we have official diplomatic relations with Iran, but not Saudi Arabia. The question is not political, the question is theological. I mean, if you... You know that in, in the in the territory of of Saudi Arabia, you know no other religion and no other religion could be accepted, and that's why you could not even carry any religious objects, even if you hide it, because that's against the rule, uh, it's against their law. So uh, we have very cordial. I mean, you know, the king of Saudi Arabia went to see the Pope twice. So there is, uh, you know, there is mutual respect, and yet uh, at the level of at the level of making it making that official, making it normalizing it, I couldn't, uh, I don't want, you know, I'm not in their seat, but I, I believe that probably the Saudi, uh, the House of Saud is not yet ready to confront the population that may revolt against such a decision. You know, the, the, the role certainly of, uh, uh, the, the role of the religious figures in these countries are, are, are very, very strong, and that's why it is easy to conflate religion and politics in these countries. Course, Although, yes. in a sense, they are exercised by two institutions, but one, uh, there is symbiotic relationship. Uh, we know very well the history of the Saudi Arabia, so there is no need to explain that. And we know that, uh, you know, how much Iran is still very much influenced by the revolution, the communist revolution of 1979. You said that Iran before 1979, yes, you said it was secular, there was the Pahlavi, etc. but deep inside a society. Why was, the society, why was it easy for Khomeini to return and triumphantly? Because deep inside a society, it was religious. And it thought, I mean, there was, uh, I mean, the social feeling, even though it was not, I wouldn't say not recognized, but it was not reflected in the how uh, the Pahlavis uh, ruled, it was already burning for, I mean, it was just looking for an opening to become a religious system. So there are, of course, uh, what we call secular people in Iran. There are so many. And, and, and even there, intellectually, it's very vibrant. It's very open. Even though the Catholic Church is very small and it uh, certainly has limitations to, to exercise its presence, but they have very fruitful uh, relationship at the level, at the intellectual level. We have made exchanges even uh, ancient documents and uh, exchange professors, etc. And we have invited a number of Vatican personalities to Isfahan, for instance, or to Qum. So uh, th there are indeed uh, these small steps, but you know these are again, you know, drops in the ocean of that context of that reality, which is still very difficult to separate between. Uh, you know very well the supreme leader is not the president; it's 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 the Ayatollah. The, so again, although there is a president, there is a parliament, but there is the Ayatollah, who is really the supreme leader. It's like that also in the House of Saud, there is the dynasty, but you know, there's the really Wahhabi religious leaders who really, in a sense, control what we call the, the morals or the behavior of the country. There are changes going on with this new prince there in Saudi Arabia. You know, they just but you can't expect the, any yeah. real significant but changes. That's far. exactly my exactly point about the Arab Spring. You know, how much the Arab string became legendary, especially in the United States, how much President Obama is to praise, you know, this is the start of democracy in the Middle East, but it's easier to topple a dictator than to make a democracy work. That's why I would like to challenge everybody to say that democracy is not for everybody, of course, well, no, it's to provoke. But that's the question, I'm, yeah. I'm not question. I don't think yeah. it's a question of uh, democracy is not good for anyone, but... For no, I, I, I was, I, I'm sorry, I mean, I was just to clarify that, you know, in 1939, uh, it, uh, 1942, still during the war, uh, Pius XII made a big radio message about democracy, and he made it a kind of implicit that democracy was not for everybody, so he was criticized. But he said the Pope 
clearly it does say that. What I'm saying is that you know, not all people, not every context, not every society is ready for democracy to work. There are, there are bases to work on in order to make democracy well, work. Well, well, yeah. When it's taken as certain principles of democratic form of government, I think everyone, whether be that a Muslim, Christian, yeah. Saudi Arabia, Iran, would like to be free, would like to be free individual. They may believe in anything they want to believe, but to be a free individual, that's, that's a principle that most people, they would like to have a human right, recognize they have a right that cannot be arbitrarily violated. What you, when you talk about the Arab Spring, and I think what, has, what the mistake we made, the West made in particular, we're trying to introduce a concept, political concept, that is totally alien yeah. to the communities. Not Precisely. that Egyptians don't like to be democratic at yeah. one point, or the Iraqis, or the, or the Syrians. The question is, what sort of process you have to go through in order mm. to introduce democratic form of government that is going to be accepted? To be working. And what we've done, the mistake we've done in the United States and others, we basically say, here, topple the government, yeah. here's what you have, democracy is a nice, you know, sweet pill to swallow, swallow it, you wake up in the morning, you're going to be free. And well, the, <laughs> that's what happened in Egypt. They had an election. They woke up in the morning and said, now, where is the food? Where is the, where is the health Where is the beef? Where is the beef? <laughs> where are the better schools? So, so the Arab Spring, in my view anyway, it's that it has started a process. I don't think the Arab Spring is dead. It's over. Uh, no, it has not, not succeeded. The idea will always but, be there. But yeah. the, idea, the idea is that it has to start and it's going to continue to percolate. And what we are hoping is that the, the countries that have gone through the Arab Spring, like Syria, like Egypt, will eventually understand that the people have rights, uh, notwithstanding the, uh, the impact and the influence of religion, that the person still have mm -hmm. the right to live as a free individual. Yeah with respect to the human yeah. rights. Yeah, I think that's a very basic, uh, really, concept of, uh, I mean, you know, the, I, would, I, would, I would dare say that the, the biggest victims of the Arab Spring in some of the countries, or we might say the imposition of what we call democracy in the Middle East, are the minorities. If you look at Iraq, you look at Syria. I mean, you know, just the, the Christians in Iraq, uh, you know, before the fall of Saddam Hussein, I, I'm not certainly justifying Saddam Hussein, but I'm saying that you know uh, there were uh, more than two million uh, uh, Catholics in Iraq at the time, mostly Chaldeans, and uh, now there are around three hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know all of them have been uh, fled, persecuted, and you know they have they went to other countries. But uh, that it's the same thing with Syria. It, it's the paradox that in the countries like that, I mean Saddam Hussein, uh, El Assad, the minorities. Uh, the minorities Actually, they prefer were better, them. They were better off. Yeah, they, they were, were better, better off, off under off. them. Yeah, pressure. because yeah. I think the fundamental principle uh, for 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 certainly democracy to work, for the Arab Spring to work, is that you know the society must be ready for a pluralistic society based on the rule of law. If there is no, if if this law is not accepted, if if, if the majority would just impose on the minority, there could never be a working democracy. Well, this is exactly the point, which means you need a process. You need education. You have to allow the process to evolve, the political process. And what we've done, the mistake we've done is we basically we said here it yeah. is adopted. It's, through it there. it's going to be just fine. And now, of course, what needs to be done, that's what bring me back to the question of religion. That is the extent to which a political democratic process can mushroom and grow, however slow, in these various Arab countries, only then the religious conflict may well begin to subside. Do you buy into that argument? Yes, I do believe in that. Uh, the, the, the thing there is uh, uh, these uh, societies, there's countries where minorities are being persecuted or killed, is that, you know, it's also a tragedy for these societies. Because as you said, uh, uh, if, uh, if even uh, uh, they, they become monolithic, uh, and then uh, if if, if these societies are to grow in, in, in democracy, in, 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 in a pluralistic society, then uh, these minorities would have been very uh, fundamental to them. And not only that, for us, from, from, Christi from the Christian point of view, as the Pope said, I could not imagine a Middle East without Christians. That's where we were born. That's where, you know, for centuries and centuries, the Catholics, the Jews, and the, uh, and the Muslims there, 
in most of the times they had cordial relationships. They live side by side with one another, and then suddenly this comes, why, well, you know, especially in northern Iraq, I mean, the tragedy and the shock of so many Christian families there is that they were, they were, uh, they were betrayed by their old neighbors. Right. You know, probably also they had interest to have their house, to have their property, etc. But you know, was was it, did this thing come just you know recently, or has it been there for centuries? But again, you know, we go back and think as the Holy Father would always say, let us not let us not surrender. I mean, you know, these are tragedies. You know, there will be really in terms of of, of you know of numbers of the question. The Middle East Christians have very, very much diminished in number in the Middle East. But probably there has never been as many Christians in the Middle East as of now, especially the Christ Catholics for that matter. You know, just, uh, you know, just imagine there are around probably almost two million Filipinos in the Middle East now, mm -hmm. and most of them are Catholics, or 85% Catholics. And then the Indians, most of the Indians in the Middle East are from Kerala. That's where uh, Christianity above all Catholicism is strongest with more than two -third, one third of the population. So it's, 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 uh, it's a new phenomenon, but it couldn't, it could never replace the original Arab uh, and uh, in a population who have been there for centuries and who would be gone or who would be extinct. I mean, look at the Aramaic community. The Aramaic is, is the only people who still speak the language that Jesus used as their daily language, which was, not, uh, which was not Hebrew. So once we lose this very small community there in the plains of Nineveh and in Syria, once we lose them, I don't know, it's like Israel trying to save the Samaritans. You know? <laughs> there are only 42 Samaritans left. They said, we have to, it's like uh, saving the pandas. So uh, I think uh, if we would even accept that kind of solution, I mean, if the Middle East countries would love, would really see the importance of the presence of these Christians, original, who have been there for centuries. You know, we would accept a, a panda solution. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not only that these people have the right to be there, also the responsibility as, as full citizens. This is one of the things also that they are not, they, if they are recognized as secondary citizens, if they are recognized as not equal in terms of citizenship, to a majority religion, just like to a, uh, to a majority ideology, then they could never live there in peace and they could never be accepted as equals. So that means I think that's another fundamental element of really a pluralistic society. When things, I mean, all, when everybody, irrespective of their religion, of their culture, of their ethnic origin, are considered equal before the law as citizens of that country. Once that doesn't come, I don't think these people will I mean, uh, we are not very optimistic about their survival there. I think when we when I continue the discussion, was I'd like to leave a few minutes to take a few questions. So I uh, will take. Please limit yourself to a question uh, to His Excellency the Ambassador, and uh, I would like to entertain uh, you know, as many questions as we can. We have about about 15 minutes. So just raise your hand. We have a mic available. Uh, you know uh, to. Unless, of course, we solve all the religious conflict around the world, there'll be no questions asked. So, right there, please. Thank you. Hello. Is this working? Okay. <laughs> um, so, I actually kind of have a challenging question for you. So, I actually work in counterterrorism. I've worked for Tannenbaum Council, which works in interreligious conflict. So, you, the root causes predominantly of terrorist activity is actually not religious, but is actually rooted in economic, lack of economic opportunities and education, et cetera, but is packaged as such as religious. So if that's the case, with your statement that you said that Islam would benefit more on having a centralized leader to counteract this perversion, I mean, do you really think that's the case? And to be extremely blunt, I don't think that's ever benefited the Catholic Church. Well, uh, if that's what you think, but we think differently, we think it benefits us. <laughs> if you ask other religions without that, we would say, you know, we say that we, we, we don't like our Pope, and we said, oh, you, you, you miss what you have, we, uh, what we would like to have in our, in our own 
religion. I, I'm not trying to say that there must be, I'm not trying to say that Islam must have uh, you know, one uh, 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 pyramidal uh, you know, structure just like the Catholic Church because that's not their history. And that's not how they conceive their, their, their religion. But I'm trying to say that if everyone in an Islam or in a Christian is free to interpret, uh, uh, to interpret their sacred text uh, to their wish, I mean, uh, who would tell them that that is not the correct uh, interpretation of their text? Besides, I would certainly say that the root of all this is economic lack of opportunities. Of course, these are uh, good arguments and these are very stereotype arguments at the Security Council debates, even at the, uh, at the General uh, Assembly debates. But, you know, no matter how much you say that, these people, the, the fundamentalists, the radicals, the terror, the terror groups, they are claiming to do it in the name of religion. So how are we going to counter that? Where we, are, we have what we call emptying the swamp that feeds this terrorism, and that's where we go. We fight the roots of them, where there is economic opportunity for young people, education, and, uh, and then there are the, the political grudges, and there are the historical roots. Yeah. So there are so many causes of this. Why, would, uh, why, would, why do you think that this uh, ISIS would claim to a caliphate. Do you think that there is no historical reason for that they are claiming a caliphate, that this is just a mere economic question? Sometimes we focus everything, we reduce everything to an economic or even a political base. Well, I think that's correct, but that is very, I think that's insufficient to explain this phenomenon. And uh, I, I believe, I still believe, that the best way to counteract, to counter this narrative of the religious narrative of the terror acts is another religious narrative. We could, I mean, okay, economic, that's most probably most of cases. You know that many of those who were, uh, who fell into the trap of being recruited uh, by ISIS from the West, they are not necessarily the poorest Muslims or the poorest youth well, in the West. Well, I think, I think uh, really it's a combination. I mean, there's no question that many of the radicals young men and women in, in Europe or in the Middle East are poor, despondent, no, no future, no, they have no, no place to, to, to go to. I mean, the whole Arab Spring began when the Tunisian um, uh, graduate from university um, ended up selling fruit in the market and he ended up committing uh, self-immolation. Now, there's no question about it, but what, what's happening here is the deprivation that these young men specifically are experiencing, they have become are vulnerable. And what these groups like ISIS are using now religion to create a new, a, a new um, environment so that the young men be able to identify with. And so they want something to identify with which is bigger than themselves. So it's a combination of the two. There is, there is economic despondency, there is economic problem, poverty and all of that, and religion now is being now utilized by the extremists in order to attract those who are vulnerable. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about the uh, relationship between the, uh, the Latin Church and the Eastern Church, the Eastern Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox. Can you speak a little louder? Yeah. The, uh, uh, the relationship between the Latin Church in Rome and uh, the Russian Church and the Greek Orthodox Church, because we, you know, we've seen conflicts in the Balkans, and we're now seeing an ongoing conflict in the eastern provinces of Ukraine. So if you could address that. Yes, certainly the, the relationship with the, uh, with the, patriarch, uh, with the patriarchate, uh, the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, has been uh, solidified, has been going on stronger every, every, we might say every year, every decade that passes. Uh, since uh, the meeting of Atenagoras and Paul VI in Jerusalem in 1964. So I think that's for us uh, a landmark. Certainly, you know, uh, we might say reestablishing relationships and friendships after almost uh, more than 1,000 years, as you know, that's been 1054 when there's, there was the, uh, the great season. So here we have a very good relationship, especially now with this pope, you know, the, 
the, the, the relationship with the Greek Orthodox Church has been very much improved. And also with uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, as uh, you could uh, easily uh, imagine, you know, there has been a kind of a rivalry between the, the Patriarchate of Constantinople and the Russian Orthodox Church, the Patriarchate of Moscow and of all Russia. Of, all, of course, the Patriarchate of Moscow and of all Russia is much bigger, and we might see as more influence, more power, more powerful while the Patriarchate of Constantinople has been reduced really to uh, almost like a symbol, although spiritually he is the ecumenical patriarch, and we recognize that. As I say that it has improved, uh, I will just cite the meeting of the Pope, uh, Pope Francis with uh, the Patriarch of uh, Kirill in Cuba, where for the first time after the more than 1,000 years, you know, the, the Russian Orthodox, of course at that time there was, you know, uh, there was no Russian Orthodox at that time, but in saying, you know, after more than 1,000 years after the Great Schism of 1054, it was the first time that the uh, the Orthodox Church, uh, with the Patriarchate of Moscow and of all Russia, signed uh, a common declaration with the Catholic Church. So I, I think uh, I, I think it is a very important historical movement. The problem in Ukraine is a little bit different. You know, it's a First of all, it's a problem between the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian, or the, the Church of the Orthodox Church uh, in Ukraine, and uh, the Patriarchate of Moscow. There is a part of the Ukrainian Orthodox who wants to create a patriarchate, and there is a part which is faithful to the Patriarchate of Moscow. And with that split, there comes also another element: the Eastern Catholics. You know, these are Catholics who have who have uh, of the Eastern Rites, which is really what we call the, uh, we call them all the Eastern Rites uh, as a generic term, but you know, there are the, the, the Greek Eastern, there are the, the Slavs, etc. So these Catholics uh, are, are, you know, are Catholics in the full sense because they are, you know, united to Rome, but they do the liturgy like, very much like, especially externally, like the Orthodox. And then these Catholic, uh, uh, these uh, Eastern Catholics, I, th I, w I wouldn't say, I couldn't say the percentage, we don't know, but they seem to have come out in support for, some of them at least, some bishops have come out in support for uh, the creation of a patriarchate of Kiev. So that has certainly irked uh, the, Russian, uh, the Russian church, and, that, and then here comes uh, the war in Ukraine, and then you know, the, 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 uh, uh, all these things play out in that, in that war, from the, at least from this religious point of view. So uh, uh, the position of the Holy See, of course, there is, you know, to, uh, uh, you know the, the, this whole problem is really outside that religious sphere because this is a question of international law. So if you read all our positions, I just uh, made a very short statement to the Security Council last week Thursday, I guess it was, or Friday, in, in which we uh, reiterated the position of the Holy See that is expressed in the proper forum dealing with this question that is the Organization of the Security and Cooperation of Europe, the OACE. That's where debate, this debate is big, not at the Security Council, especially at the Security Council, of course, there is the veto power of Russia. <laughs> so uh, it's, it becomes complicated. But really, from the religious point of view, that has also irked I will say I understand that there is a tension between the Ukrainian Eastern Catholics and the Orthodox uh, of Russia because of the question of the division among the Orthodox Ukrainians. We take okay. a few other questions. Um, like there, and then we'll come back here, right there. Can you, can you talk about uh, the diplomatic role um, well, uh, go ahead. Uh, next person is this lady. Diplomatic okay. role. Uh, Speak a bit louder, please. Di diplomatic role in the um, persecution of uh, Catholics and Coptic Christians in the Middle East. Well, uh, we uh, certainly uh, move on, on different levels and in different uh, different levels and uh, different, uh, we might say, avenues of uh, trying to stop that uh, killing. I mean, the, the like, declaration principles is all over the place, whether it's with the government in the Middle East, 
in which we have diplomatic relations, all of them except Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And then uh, we have, of course, the ambassadors to the Holy See here at the United Nations. And then at the level also even of the government of Washington, you know, the, the persecution of the Christians and other religious and ethnic minorities in the Middle East is clearly, I mean, there is no question, is a violation of, a fundament, of fundamental human rights, above all the right to life and then the right to religious belief, the right to religious expression, etc., which are all defined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So there are no questions about that. The problem is really is how to treat that from the political level. You know, the religious aspect, the religious aspect of the whole Middle East crisis has become so secondary in the debate at the United Nations, especially at the Security Council. The debate at the Security Council is focused on what to do with al-Assad, who, I mean, the Americans came out very early saying that the president of Syria will never have a role in any solution. I think that that's, you know, bringing the horse out of the, uh, of the gate too early. And now, you know, that's why, you know. And uh, with Russia gaining things in the ground, it becomes very difficult. So all the debates there, there has never touched really any resolution at the Security Council level that condemned religious persecution of Christians and other ethnic and religious minorities in the Middle East. That has not been treated. Instead, uh, we have uh, Catholic institutions above all and other people, you know, other uh, NGOs, other institutions that have moved a dossier across in many parts, especially the, uh, the European Parliament, uh, the House of Commons in, uh, in, in London, and, 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 uh, and Congress here in the United Nations, in which define this persecution of Christians as a crime, as genocide. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's why we, 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 we are, I would just end with this, uh, the, the European Union, because of that movement, uh, the European Parliament, I mean, approved, adopted a unilateral resolution defining this as, as genocide. The House of Commons of London voted in a very big majority, I think only, I think four or five only, only against, on the same text, practically, and also the Congress of the United States voted it, uh, you know, passed it so, so, so easily, I think there was even, uh, you know, unanimity calling it as genocide. But these are legislative movements. We have moved to this legislative movement. But how could you make governments, how could you make a security council define it as genocide? That's another step. And it still seems to be that the security council is not interested to go to that direction. OK, yes. Hi. First of all, thanks for being here tonight. Uh, you talk about the separation between the state and religion. And I was wondering how a secular state looks like, because you have, for example, the French model in which the, in which the state uh, does interfere in the social life for preserving that separation. And you see, for example, courts ruling uh, for avoiding the use of the niqab in, social, in public spaces. But you can oppose that model to the US model in which the US uh, court system doesn't interfere and the state uh, does not prevent that separation. And arguably that's the Western model of secularism. But you could say that Syria is a multi-confessional state in which the constitution defends uh, every single right of every single religion to participate in social life. So in that case, a secular state which be, will be one in which religions can have a role in social life. So I was wondering which model of secularism do you think is the best one or which <laughs> definition of a secular state you could give to us? Thanks. Yeah, that certainly is a very big question. But uh, first of all, uh, uh, the, uh, the position, the doctrine, you might say, of the Catholic Church on this question of church-state relations are very clear in a document of what we call the Second Vatican Council. It's a document called Gaudium et Spes. It's called the Social uh, Constitution of the Church in the modern world. It's called Gaudium et Spes, which means uh, joys and uh, hopes. <laughs> That's the translation. The first two words, uh, the first three words of uh, the document. That the Church recognizes the autonomy of the state 
from the church and the autonomy of the church from the state. However, this church and this state are concerned of a common subject, and that is the citizen, that is the human person. And thus, they are, in a sense, bound to collaborate to make that, you know, to make that subject flourish. So there is a separation, there is autonomy of both, but at the same time, they are condemned, in a sense, to collaborate because they are working for the same subject, for the same person, that person who is religious and that person who is a citizen. Now, if you ask me <laughs> which is uh, the best model of separation of church and state, uh, I, I mean, I, I think, to be, frankly, uh, according to the uh, Constitution of the United States and uh, the, fir the First Amendment, it's the First Amendment, I think that is, that reflects in a better way the position of the church. You know, it's very important to, to, to know that the United States was born out of religious freedom, religious persecution in Europe, the Puritans, those persecuted there, they came here as called the pilgrims. <laughs> and then, you know, that's the foundation. So it's, it was very much in the minds of these people. And yet, most of the, if not all the founders of, of, of the United States, they were very practicing, very strong Protestants. They were strong Puritans, Quakers, uh, above all Anglicans or Episcopalians, Presbyterians, etc., etc. And yet, in spite of the dominance of the Protestant religion, in spite of the dominance, especially at the time, of the Anglicans, most of them were Anglicans, yet made it clear in the First Amendment that not a single religion would have official standing before the law, that all religions are equal before the law. And people who form formulated, who promulgated this expression, this formula, were people who were deeply religious, and yet they recognized, in spite of the fact that at that time, not only at the time, but we are talking even until 1960s, the Catholics were very much persecuted in the United States and the other religious minorities, and then later on the Mormons, etc., etc. And yet, in spite of their, even this, in spite of the fact that they kind of despised other religions, they stick to this fundamental principle that no religion is above the other in front of the law. I think this is, uh, 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 I, I, but this is my opinion, I think this is the kind of, of uh, an arrangement between church and state church to mean religions and state, I think that works better. The, 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 the problem with, uh, with the laicite uh, in France is that the state controls religion. I mean, religion has no more, doesn't have that autonomy anymore. Of course, there's a long parallel in the history of religion. And just imagine that the Catholic Church, for instance, in France, they are not re registered. The parishes or the diocese, the Catholic Church, are not registered as religion. They are registered as associations of Catholic faithful. So, I, I mean, I, I think that is negative. And now, you know, they are, they are limiting here and there the rights of religions and controlling what religions can do. I, 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 think that has, I think that has backfired in a sense, especially when it comes to the integration of, of the millions and millions of first and second generation uh, Maghriban above all. So that's part of the whole alienation there. I mean, that's my opinion. Uh, but if you were to ask me, uh, also in the Philippines, I think we have more or less the same Ameri uh, as, as a model in the United States. There is no official religion. All religions are equal before the law. And to, Tell you the truth, for instance, in the army, you know, there is a group of chaplains to the armed forces of the Philippines. You see, even though the Catholics are 85% of the population, around 83-85%, and let's say a Protestant church has around 0.5% of the population, or uh, uh, you know, another another church would be 1% of the population, there is an equal uh, we'd say rotation of the head chaplain. So it's not the Catholic bishop to the, to the forces who is head of the chaplains simply because 83, 85% of the soldiers are Catholic, but even the chaplain of the 0.5% of the force has equal right in this rotation. So I think that's also 
a kind of a, just an example of why we see that with this kind of rule of law, with this kind of recognition of the other, you know, of the other parties of the other religions or other political parties when it comes to politics, I think this is one of what they call the essential points. I think of, you know, having uh, religion play a positive role in, in a pluralistic society based on the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, we we are really out of time. It's uh, after eight o'clock already. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to thank be here. Thank you very much. And yeah. I think it was just a big thing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.